What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. He said to him, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to God. Good teacher, what must I do? Let us pray. Lord, give us hearts to know your love, ears to hear your whispers, eyes to see your glory, and lips to speak only your truth. Amen. As you may or may not know at this point, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and my father is a priest who's in town this week for his 20th reunion from VTS, and he's the one in the collar right there. <laughs> and when I called to tell him that I was preaching while he was here this week, his first question was something that many Episcopal readers, seminarians, and especially priests ask whenever they hear of a sermon. What's the lectionary? We're a predictable bunch. I then learned that his senior sermon preached only about 150 feet away from here in the old Emmanuel Chapel was on this same gospel. Way cool, I thought. <laughs> We're also a nerdy bunch. And I got him to send it to me. And so with his permission, I'll be weaving some of his comments in with my own this morning in my quest to preach with a passion I know came from him. This morning, as a seminarian, I can both identify with and feel annoyed 
by the rich man in today's gospel. At first sight, he runs up to Jesus and he kneels down, throwing himself at his feet, saying, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He sounds so excited. He sounds so eager. He sounds so willing. I see this guy and I think, man, he's really going for it, you know? That's cool. In fact, he looks to me like the, a very near perfect candidate to become one of Jesus' disciples. Dropping to his knees in front of Jesus, he certainly seemed to have a better attitude than those disciples who were arguing two weeks ago about who would sit at Jesus' right and left when they got to heaven. And this guy's lived an upright, clean life. He comes and he says, what do I have to do to be a part of the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells him to obey the law, to honor God and his neighbor and his mother and father and to live a holy life. And the man replies, been there, done that. I've lived right since I was a kid. And Jesus says, fair enough. Now, go and sell everything that you have, leave your home, and follow me. Here's where I get a little bit annoyed. He walks off, head held low, he's dejected and feels like he's been sent away, but really he just turned away himself. Did he think Jesus was just going to say, okay, buddy, you're with me? You know, I don't know. Maybe if this man had agreed, Jesus would have had another challenge and another and another, as many challenges as needed until he got to the point where he realized that there's nothing he can do to deserve entry into this kingdom. Maybe I can understand a little bit of his frustration with our Lord, but all that I have, my cell phone, my TV, my bed, are we all called to do that, Jesus? If we give up all our capital, what do I have left to give? But I can't answer that question for this man. However, having left behind a lot, home, friends, animals, and a good chunk of my stuff so that I could come here to seminary, I can say that challenges keep on coming for us. Life keeps coming for us all, and Jesus keeps asking for just one more thing. Hilary of Portier, a 4th century theologian in France, says the man became arrogant through the observance of the law. He did not recognize that the consummation of the law is Christ. He assumed he could be justified by works alone. I am sometimes guilty of this as well, and I'd wager I'm not the only one. Maybe the challenges for the man would come until he saw the point that it really doesn't matter what he had done, what I do, or what we do. For mortals, Jesus said, it is impossible. No matter what tricks we try to use to get their relative size a little bit closer, we can't put that great big camel through the eye of that little bitty needle. But we try, don't we? Oh boy, we try. We put all our might into trying to find a way to stuff that candle through that needle. Yeah, we say, but he said, for God, all things are possible. Maybe if we push real hard from the back. I've done everything you've said I should, Lord. I've been to church whenever I'm in town. Maybe if we yank real hard from the front. I've given to the annual fund, and to the capital drive, and to the youth group, and to the United Way. Maybe if we wet one end of the camel, and squint down real tight, and we hold our tongues just right, 
I've been an usher and served on vestry. I've taught Sunday school for pity's sake. We try and we try and we try to figure out what we can do to inherit the kingdom of God. I can follow you, we say. We try to do our very best and Jesus always asks us for just a little bit more. I can stay on the narrow way. We try to go that extra mile and Jesus always asks for just one more step. I can make it through that needle-eyed gate that is sometimes interpreted as a gate to the new Jerusalem. In the end, a camel still won't fit through the eye of a needle. And with all of our eye, 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 we are hopelessly lost. Lost but still given direction Jerome said, This is why those who are rich find it hard to enter the kingdom of heaven, for it is a kingdom which desires for its citizens a soul that soars aloft free from all ties and hindrances. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. When once you have put your hand to the plow, you must not look back. When once you stand on the housetop, you must, not, you must think no more of your clothes within. Even Elijah, in his quick translation to heaven, could not take his mantle with him, but left in the world the garments of the world. Even with that, though, only Jesus, only the good teacher who must be God in today's gospel because he is good with a capital G, can save us. St. Clement of Alexandria asserts that God gives us what we need to enter the kingdom, but to save the unwilling is an act of compulsion. But to save the willing is the act of one showing grace. You see, the point in this morning's gospel story is not so much that for God all things are possible, but that for God all things are possible. Maybe, as the colic suggests, we must look for grace to proceed and to follow us. Only when I stop asking what I can do to inherit eternal life, only when you come to understand that your own efforts are just not the point, only when we stop relying on how qualified we are and realize that all of our starched button-down collars, all of our flowing finery, all of our clean vestments and clean linens, even this beautiful new building we are in, are mere rags in God's eyes. Only then will we find ourselves already living in the kingdom of God. In our words and in our works, in our prayers and in our praises, in our living and in our giving, we must come to the realization that it is simply not about us. It's not about how well we can live our lives, how righteous we try to be. It's not about how much we have, how much we give, or how much goes on to that little pledge card. It's not about how well we can talk the talk or even how well we can walk the walk. What it is about is the one who laid aside the glories of heaven to become one of us. It's about the one who was whipped and beaten for our sake. It's about the one who gave up his very life, not to guard some narrow, needle-eyed gate, but to fling wide the gates of eternal life. All of our songs of praise, all our holy living, all our faithful giving ought to be, should be, and must be purely a response to the absolute enormity of his love for us. It is in Christ's love, it is Christ's mercy and Christ's grace that will lead us through the gate into the kingdom of God. And maybe, just maybe, a big old camel can come too. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being in the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in 